fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. This is Al Warren here and uh, Eric Shapiro, of course, from the San Francisco Bay section is on the co-host line. How are you doing, Al? I'm always good. Good, good. Yeah. Always. Uh, no, <laughs> always. <laughs> well, you know, even, even when I'm not, I'm good, yeah, right? Sounds, I just, sounds accurate. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, a, a guest here for, for an interview, and uh, she's uh, award-winning. And uh, the book is called The Second Coming of the KKK, and it's the Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s and the American political tradition. Boy, that's a mouthful. Linda Gordon, thank you for being here. here. Well, thank you for your interest. Yeah. Um, Geez, like, first of all, this is a very uh, touchy subject. There's so much been going on in the U.S. this last couple of years. Um, uh, actually, since Trump, I guess, since uh, nationalism and, and racism and, and right. all of this stuff going on. Is that what drew you into writing this book? Is that what made you actually put this research and book out? Uh Yes and no. This, this was actually originally a chapter in a longer book. Uh, but it is true that when Trump happened and we started to see the increase in these white nationalist groups, my agent and my editor said, look, why don't you uh, expand this and turn it into a book? Uh, that was not my intention, but... Uh, I did that, although, uh, you know, if you read the book, I am a historian. I, I don't think I even mentioned uh, anything about our contemporary situation, although I suspect that many readers would see connections uh, without my having to tell them. Well, it's a constant um, – I think people don't realize how, how this is going on all the time. Like the KKK is there. And always has been, um, and they just have ebbs and flows, right? They go up and they go down. They get more power and then they lose power, and it goes a different way. So this is this is really not something that just comes out of nowhere, right? Although the differences between the different, uh, should we say, rebirths of the clan are very different. Uh, we actually speak of there being four Ku Klux Klans. The first which is the most familiar, is the secret terror group that emerged right after the Civil War uh, was extremely violent, responsible for more than 4,000 lynchings. Uh, the, the 1920s Klan that I wrote about is different in a number of ways, but one of the main things is, first of all, it wasn't secret at all, and it had somewhere between three and five million members wow. then just very quickly uh, what historians think of as the third clan arose during the civil rights movement uh, particularly in opposition to desegregation of the schools but as often happens um, we might say that the clannish spirit uh, was really being embodied by a group that called itself the white citizens council and then the fourth clan uh, is alive today, but it is now just one small group among many, many, many small white nationalist groups. What's what's the biggest difference um, between them? Like, do, do they all, and I mean this in the sense of, um, do they all have the same common enemy, or is there differences? I think there are some enemies in common and some aren't, and isn't that in itself is a very interesting history. Of course, the first clan 
targeted exclusively African Americans, uh, and its avowed purpose was to what maintain white supremacy. What the second clan did was not they did not uh, surrender one iota of their uh, hostility to uh, black people, but they added two new targets, Jews and Catholics. And for that reason, I often call it bigotry because uh, some people see that as kind of religious um, prejudice rather than uh, racial prejudice. But I think there's a, there's a motivation that is very, very common to all of these, and that is that there's a, a, a way that people who belong to groups that have been dominant do a lot of fear-mongering and try to make people uh, frightened that these aliens, whoever they happen to be, uh, are really going to do something terrible to this country, that they're going to take it over. Um, so in that sense, I think there is a, a through line, a, a, a stream of commonness among all four of the clans. What do you think uh, the motive is? Like you're saying, uh, in terms of the fear mongering, uh, you just explained it in the sense of how they get their followers whipped up. But what do you, as you interpret this history, what are you, what are you tracking as the the uh, sincere motive? Like, what do you think is driving them? Well, you know, you might want to ask a psychologist about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I I have no insight at, into people's psychologies, but you know, I do think unfortunately, that we have so much evidence in so many parts of the world and so many times about how easy it is to rev up a fear and hatred of people who seem different. Now, sometimes there is a real material incentive, right? You can certainly understand about the first clan that their purpose was to maintain uh, African Americans in their sort of impoverished, helpless state, even though they had just been theoretically uh, freed from slavery. And so there was a huge economic interest in maintaining a low wage labor force. Um, it's, it's hard to see that uh, in many, many other areas, but I think we have to think that people it are not only interested it's not only a question of profit and money it's a question of status and i think people can get to feel very very threatened uh when somehow they feel that their status is uh being challenged and i think that's really what happened uh what started the second clan really was a massive wave of immigration that came into this country which started in about the 1880s up through 1920, and the sense that these people were going to somehow take away uh, the the essence of what made them proud to be Americans. Mm. What what do you uh, what's going on with the masks? Uh, does the current incarnation of the Klan still do that? Do they still mask? Oh, I, I don't know that. I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I'm really not expert at this. Uh, uh, you know, this uh, current iteration. Okay. There is one, uh, there's one continuity, though, and, and it, uh, let me tell you about it in terms of a, a remarkable change. The second clan uh, added to blacks, Jews and Catholics as their targets, mm -hmm. and they made all sorts of conspiracy theories about what these people were doing, they claimed that Jews and Catholics could never be patriotic Americans. But what has happened, and it happened actually rather quickly, is that the anti-Catholicism has more or less disappeared. Uh, not, yeah. not totally right away. I, re I can tell you that in 1960, when John Kennedy was running for president, there were some anti-Catholic attacks on him. Uh, again, the same thing. He's loyal to the Pope, therefore he can't be a good American. But generally speaking, that is gone. And what has happened is you have these two kinds of uh, groups that remain uh, as targets. Uh, first, 
obviously African Americans, but I think what we've seen most recently is a real escalation of the anti-Semitism yeah. uh, that's characteristic of the today's white nationalist groups. Do you know uh, when they uh, collapsed, you, as you say, in 1926, like the the big movement then? What caused that collapse? Like what what made it fall apart? Okay, this is a very interesting story. Um, in fact, the Second Clan was a for-profit corporation. It was registered in uh, Atlanta. Um, that that may seem odd because I think today many people think, well, if you're in a social movement, you should be working uh, to advance what your beliefs are rather than working to make money. But uh, th on the other hand, the profit motive is a very, very basic <laughs> American value, and that was part of what the Klan was about. What they did, uh, and this is was quite a shock to me. I think that this was the first ever social movement to hire a professional PR firm to promote them. And that is why they were able to get this phenomenal start very, very quickly up to having millions of members. And it happened uh, through uh, it's what I call recruitment by commission. Uh, in some ways, it's a pyramid scheme. Um, you, you had to pay a $10 initiation fee to join the Klan. That is, to, in today's dollars, would be way over $120. And that's very important because I think a lot of people like to think of the Klan as a, an organization of poor and uneducated people when it was a completely, mainly middle class operation. But anyway, about the scheme, I, I, if I recruit you and you give me $10, I get to keep 40% of that. You can then go and recruit someone else, and you could get 40% of that, and you on and on and on. Eventually, though, like in all pyramid schemes, uh, you run out of people to recruit. You sort of sat the market, so to speak. But certainly that financial business in the first couple of years was partly responsible for this enormous growth. It actually, well, it was a little bit religious in that they used the cross, but actually it's very occult. And it, for people who really study it, it goes back to sort of medieval, uh, all kinds of things. I have to say that when I first uh, looked at and read the details of these secret codes and secret gestures and secret movements and so on, I thought, well, this is like a 10-year-old boy playing a game. Uh, but I also came to understand that I think for a lot of participants, um, I, I have often called it a participatory theater. You get to put on this amazing costume, you conduct these rituals in the dark with torches and so on, and it's, it's kind of fun. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it, it got uh, a little bit old hat. And while the Klan had these millions and millions of members, it also had a lot of turnover because uh, a lot of people got bored with it. A lot of people started thinking, look, all this organization is doing is getting trying to get money out of me. Um, so that was partly what, what undercut it. What kind of ma manufactured stories did they do back then? They're amazing. And... Uh, you know, I, I think uh, I thought of them as unusual, although recently I've heard some that could compete in their absurdity. Well, a grandiose uh, conspiracy theory was that the reason these, uh, say, Italian Catholic and other Catholic immigrants were coming to the United States was not because they were poor, but because the Pope ordered them to come. And once here, they were supposed to be sort of underground, like moles in an espionage novel. And they were to lay low until they received the command to uh, 
help uh, uh, help uh, be the soldiers in a coup that was going to take over Washington and turn this into the United States of Catholic America. Uh, so wow. that kind of thing uh, goes on and on. Uh, then there are also smaller <laughs> little conspiracy allegations. Well, I don't know about small, but other conspiracy allegations. But, you know, I do think that all these groups uh, do have in common fear-mongering. And they also have something else in common, which is characteristic of conspiracy theories, and that is that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to uh, persuade people, uh, to, to make people doubt them by saying, well, what's the evidence? Where is the evidence for this? Because the the answer quite simply, it's kind of a circular logic, is, well, of course there is no evidence because the ex- conspiracy is secret, and that's why mm-hmm. we don't have any evidence. So you, you, con- you create for yourself a kind of a bubble that cannot be penetrated by other people trying to argue with you. Um, in the 1920s, were they prone to violence? Is that just uh, a, a minority aspect of everything they're up to? No, in fact, this is really the genius and the other part of what made the the group so both so powerful and so big, and that is that it was mainly nonviolent. There were uh, people at the edges who were doing these things, but uh, especially when the second imperial wizard, as they call them, <laughs> uh, Hiram Evans, took over, uh, these people were shrewd, and they understood that they could get much further by using uh, electoral means and by using their vast propaganda machine. They, they operated uh, about 150 print publications and they also owned two radio stations. They elected 11 governors and something like 65 congressmen. And these are people who either ran openly as Klan members or openly stating that they supported the Klan. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a completely nonviolent in its claims. Now, there were, I, I say at the edges, uh, you know, I think a lot of young guys particularly get attracted to this, and they're just sort of itching for a fight. Yeah. And it wasn't always possible for the central leadership to control that. Uh, but... This is really important because I don't think you could have easily three to five million Americans joining a group that was uh, that oriented around violence. I think a lot of people that are listening, obviously, there's a parallel, right? Century wide, because we're in the 20s right now, and with Trump, we saw resurgence. So, what? And then you said there were these four different waves. Like, so the wave you're you're writing about in this book, um, what was it that made it sort of diminish and lose momentum? Well, it's partly this business of there was so much money flowing around. There was just extraordinary reports of corruption. Uh, and after a while, people didn't, uh, didn't, didn't like that, came to resent that. I mean, for example, the guy who was the grand dragon of the Indiana clan, which was one of the very, very large clans, uh, used clan money to buy himself a very luxurious yacht, which he kept on Lake Erie, uh, that kind of thing. But then there were also uh, criminal behaviors. You know, the clan, like a lot of white Protestants, the clan was essentially a white Protestant evangelical movement, and its members were supposedly ardent pro- prohibitionists. And when they discussed prohibition and drinking, they, of course, as they did with everything, they sort of racialized it. They uh, claimed that it was only Catholics that drink and only Jews that bootleg or sell the liquor. This is all during prohibition. Now, of course, that's complete nonsense. And what would happen is that occasionally these Klan members would be caught drinking. Uh, they also were supposed to have this sort of uh, restrictive sexual morality as evangelical Protestants, and then you'd find these cases of these clan people getting caught with their mistresses or their prostitutes. So 
uh, you know, when you have that kind of ideology and you're talking about millions of people, it's pretty hard to make them conform perfectly uh, to what are supposedly the values of the group. Right. It also seems like the things you're citing with uh, these sorts of hypocrisies are very specific to the values of that point in time. Like they would be more scandalous then, but they probably like today with Trump, you know, there's so much he could get away with that would not make his followers uh, break their allegiance to him, even if he's uh, an adulterer or a sex criminal or whatnot. Um, it seems yeah, like the bar, exactly. it's just indicative of how the bar was so different at that point that they were existing in a whole other form of hypocrisy. Yes, that's absolutely true. And here's an interesting you know, development that shows you at least a little bit how, how thin or how uh, fragile that commitment to these evangelical values. And that is that after the Klan shrank uh, precipitously uh, from millions down to something like 350,000 at the end of the 20s, what you saw is that many clans people went into the American fascist groups that were arising in the 1930s. Uh, in the 1930s, we had over a hundred uh, fascist groups, and by that I mean people specifically called themselves fascists and specifically expressed their admiration for Hitler and Mussolini. Mm -hmm. And some of the groups were very violent and. Um, somewhat large, no, nothing that leveled uh, that that equaled the millions in the Klan, but say one of the big ones uh, called the German American Bund might have had as many as fifty thousand people. So uh, I think that one of the things that happened is that the Klan declined uh, as an overall organization. Um, there. It became harder to control uh, the guys that wanted to be violent. And um, if I, I, I'll just make one comment, if you don't mind, about today's white nationalists, because um, I think it's parallel. Today we have many, many, many small groups, right? Yeah. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it's good because there's no national central organization that can really try to pull people together and mobilize them and so on. But it's bad. You don't have a central organization exerting any discipline on what people should and shouldn't do. And the fact that the 20s Klan was able to be mainly nonviolent was because it had a big national organization with a strong leadership and standard publications that were uh, insisting on the Klan's principles. Let's suppose it's the 1920s and I'm an ordinary person walking around and I'm being exposed to Ku Klux Klan uh, propaganda. Uh, what, yeah. sort of me what sort of messaging were they sending out to the public? Like you did a really great job explaining how they were recruiting and how, what, what it was like internally with the fear mongering, but what are they telling, like if they're going to, it, it, what are they just telling the average person? What are their electoral agendas? Well, their electoral agenda is extremely focused on uh, the wrong kind of people and immigration restriction. Now, of course, immigration restriction mm -hmm. is only a federal uh, law, but in certain areas, uh, they work to produce local state laws, for example, in the Pacific Northwest, in Oregon and Washington, uh, it was Klan or Klanish people that put through what were called the alien land laws, which prevented, uh, we're talking mainly Japanese or Chinese immigrants, which prevented them from owning land. Mm. Um, in some cases, even present, prevented them from owning businesses. So in some cases, what they're doing is they're trying to get rid of the competition for the, quote, right people uh, who are the white Protestants. But, you know, I think a really important thing to understand about what drew people to the Klan is I think many of those people were kind of a little bit apolitical. They were probably bigoted, but, but yeah. the Klan was a fraternity. And it was it was it appeared at a time when the United States had many 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 uh, 
fraternities, most of most of which were ethnically uh, oriented. You know, you had Irish fraternities and Czech fraternities and German fraternities. And to many people, the Klan was just another one. But mm-hmm. it had uh, kind of more exciting things to offer. Uh, one of their other just extremely uh, sophisticated propaganda stuff was they conducted these massive outdoor rallies frequently on July 4th because they, of course, presented themselves as the ultra, as the uh, real patriots. But this, these kind of events, were they were like county fairs. They had all kinds of rides and contests and food and uh, in several, there was a very dramatic thing in which the Imperial Wizard would arrive uh, by airplane uh, at a time when most Americans had never seen an airplane. Mm. So this was like, wow, you know, uh, it was high entertainment. And for more like all fraternities, they provide a, a socialization and bonding. The Klan also had uh, one and a half million women. And I suspect that their kind of sociability was different, um, but nevertheless very important. It's a way that people get together with uh, friends and so on to share. So um, I think it's important to to understand that movements like this provide rewards for people that are not just political. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a social reward. Um, what's also interesting, what's so fascinating about uh, all the things you're sharing is that as the groups get splintered or as the clan waxes and wanes, the ideas never go away. It's not that I, I think um, like I would have an idealistic fantasy that, oh, it, at a certain point, they became less relevant because people became less bigoted. But it's simply untrue. It's uh, it, 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 the waxing and waning seems to be more tied up in uh in the internal politics and the dynamics of the group. You're absolutely right. And I would uh, add to that, uh, this is a surmise, you know, in the 1920s, there were no national polls. But my guess is that a majority of white Protestants would have agreed with the Klan about Catholics and Jews. Wow. Uh, At the top of, you know, we had a lot of what are called nativists, uh, who I discuss a little bit in the book, uh, people against immigration. But the nativist movement was a movement of the very rich and the very distinguished. It was filled with Harvard professors and so-called scientists who were into eugenics. And they they came up with, quote, unquote, data. Uh, for example, uh, they began to do what they called IQ testing of immigrants that were arriving at Ellis Island, and they concluded, for example, that uh, I may have not have the figures right in my head, but that 70% of Jews are morons, and the Chinese (laughs) are just... I'm laughing, I'm laughing because I'm Jewish. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, and the Chinese are ineducable. There's just no way that you can educate the Chinese, and these are people who call themselves scientists and who publish in these journals... You know, another thing about the eugenics, I'm sure you know what that is, about the science of breeding to create a better human stock. In the 1920s, just about every college biology textbook had a section on eugenics. That was considered, uh, you know, good science. Wow. Um, It's amazing. The rhetoric has softened. Like, you're not allowed to say these, I mean... uh... I sh- actually, I shouldn't jump to conclusions because we have QAnon nowadays that says completely outrageous things. But it seems like in the public sphere, you know, you're not allowed to make these sort of wildly uh, general declarations. But even though the rhetoric is softened, the ideas, these ideas of bigotry are very, very hard to uh, get rid of. That's true. And and here's a, one connection I would make with what, uh, what goes on today. You know, um, when I first started to talk about the Klan, I, people would say, well, you know, a lot of people are anti-Semitic. They just keep it to themselves. Yeah. Um, and to that I would say, well, that's true, but it's also true that it makes a difference when you're shouting those things from the rooftops, so to speak. 
And I think the main achievement of the Klan was not legislation, but it's actually in some ways one of the main achievements that I see of Donald Trump, which is they normalized uh, racist and bigoted talk. Uh, They made it respectable to talk that way in public. And I think there is a difference between when people are whispering this stuff privately to each other, uh, you know, in their living rooms and when they are announcing it publicly, because when it gets public like that, it is very, very dangerous. Yeah, it's yeah, because I I think people want they're looking for any excuse, you know, people have. Uh, certain things that are deficient in their own lives, it's very easy to to take it out on another party and say the blame goes over here. Something I'm really curious about with the 1920s is I I presume um, Mexico sounds like it was less of a factor. It's more in terms of the immigration picture was more focused on Asian Americans. Is that is that yeah accurate? You, yeah yeah the the thing about the immigration restriction is that. Uh, there was no restriction on immigration from Latin America, and there was an economic reason for that, because by the 1920s, in these huge farms, they're not really farms, they're like uh, plantations uh, in California, you know, these thousands of acres, the the labor force was by that time dominated by either Mexican Americans or Mexican people who were coming across the border and the big growers were an enormously powerful political lobby and they did not want any uh, restriction that would uh, affect Mexicans. Um, That's another thing that's typical of the Klan is that different chapters would respond to the particular conditions in their region. That's why in the Pacific Northwest there was an emphasis on Asians because Mm -hmm. that is where uh, Asians were coming. And in California, uh, they uh, were even going out into the fields and uh, uh, they had a conflict with the growers because their racism made them think that Mexicans shouldn't be in this country, but the big growers wanted them. Wow. Um, Linda, something I've always been so curious about, I feel a little embarrassed that I don't know, is I have no idea why they're called the Ku Klux Klan. Like, where does the name come from? Oh, nobody, there are a lot of theories, but okay. it's uh, actually from uh, a certain kinds of medieval stuff. The, the, the uh, uniforms and the hoods, Mm -hmm. Uh, You can see that, actually, oddly enough, in the Catholic tradition, uh, in these kind of pilgrimages and penitences, particularly in Spain, where people wore these kind of of costumes. Uh, But the Mm -hmm. Klan's terminology was actually, I think, playful, and I think people enjoyed it. They, oh. Every single one of their terms started with KL, right? You have a oh. playlist, you have a convocation, you have a clavern. Oh, wow. And uh, they, they uh, you know, it's funny. When I was younger, uh, people on the left were uh, spelling America with three Ks instead of a C. Oh, that's right. As yeah. a kind of critical of America. Well, the Klan did that proudly. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, anyway, there's there are qu- quite a number of studies that I didn't go into of the sources of these bizarre codes. I mean, for example, they they renamed every day of the week, they renamed every month of the year. That was the kind of thing that made me see it as a kind of play acting, and I cannot believe that the average member actually memorized all of these. Uh, different codes. Yeah, oh, that's uh, that's fascinating that it, that it was playful because, like, uh, from my vantage point, I, w- I would presume the, this is like the least playful, the most self serious group of people imaginable. But it makes sense because they're socializing. Like you said, there's a level of excitement. They're having fun, so it's almost like there's a certain music in all the caves. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, um, Linda, and I think what, the role of women there is very important. Oh, uh, uh, tell us more about the role of women. All right. Well, uh, it's very interesting, and I think it has a lot in common with women and other conservative movements. Because if you talked, looked at the official view that would be in the 
papers or, or, or what the women would say if you asked them about the role of women, it would be very traditional and conservative. Women are supposed to be mothers and wives and to make their homes beautiful and so on. Uh, that's true in a lot of conservative movements. But then you look at what they're doing, and it's quite different. And uh, I think people who study this would say Phyllis Schlafly is a, a good example of this. Uh, first of all, I think they actually started to try to assert their independence against the male clan, mm. which wanted to have the right to appoint who should be the heads of the local women's clans. Oh, wow. And many of them uh, put up with that. Uh, there's a great story in the book that I love because it's from my hometown. It's Portland in which uh, some male clan heavy tried to do that. And not only did the women stop him, but at some point they actually they actually fought with him physically and beat him with, uh, they said, rolled up umbrellas. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good story. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the women did do a huge amount of work for the male clan because yeah. every time there was one of these big rallies, uh, it was women who organized the games, women who organized the food. There were uh, clan youth groups, a little bit like Hitler Youth in the 1930s. Wow. And, you know, everything that had to do with children, uh, women were mainly... Uh, in charge of. Um, I think also that the women were uh, perhaps uh, more um, more deeply committed to prohibition than the men. For in a lot of middle class families, uh, it was not considered proper for women to drink at that time, and so it was easier for women to uh, to take that position. But I also just think there is. A lot of sorority women's they for example they they established a particular clan ritual for a christening, a clan ritual for a wedding, a clan ritual for a funeral and these are all there's one book called the Cloran, which is sort of the Bible of the clan, but it mainly is a rule book it sets out the procedures that you're supposed to use in these various uh, rituals. And I think the women were very, uh, very much uh, behind that kind of stuff. As a uh, historian, what was it that initially drew you to this topic? Oh, well, uh, this I should say this is the first time and probably the last time I'm ever going to write about uh, a right-wing movement, something that okay. I consider very unpleasant. But I could imagine. Uh, the book that it was originally part of, which will appear someday, was a book about social movements in the 20th century U.S., in which I was using a case study to look at sort of each, several of the main social movements that we've seen, uh, you know, some of them like the Montgomery bus boycott or the uh, United Farmers Workers. And the, but in the 1920s, the Klan was far and away the biggest movement. And furthermore, I thought maybe it's not a good idea to have a book about social movements that sort of carries the impression that all social movements are good. And those are the reasons that led me to get into this. Um, it was interesting, but I, sometimes I have to say I just felt, um, I don't know, on the polluted by having to read all this bigoty and racist stuff. Oh, man, I can imagine I think, I think it's really important. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I decided I was not going to preach in any way about the present, but I think it is important, and I think people who read it would see uh, the connectives and would begin to uh, consider what what is the power of the fear-mongering that uh, makes people feel that uh, that diversity is a problem. Mm. Uh, that was really central to the Klan's idea. Their view was that only a homogeneous population can make a strong country, and that the moment it becomes diverse, uh, 
it weakens the country's values. Um, I think uh, that is perhaps said more strongly, but I think there are people today who feel that way. Mm. And uh, I also see that I would like them to look at conspiracy theories from the past (laughs) in the hopes that those conspiracy theories will uh, make them think about today's conspiracy theories. But I I have to tell you, I I have no illusions that uh, this book is going to be widely read by people who would be favorable to clannish ideas. Mm, Yeah. Hey, so do you have a website or do you have anything like that or are you staying away from a social presence? I, I did. Not, it's not focused on the book. I do. It's not focused on the book, and it's pretty uh, sort of scholarly. It just lists things. But it is, it's uh, www.lindagordonhistorian.org. And Linda Gordon Historian is one word and all lowercase. Fantastic. We'll put that up on, on the website, too. And, uh, and uh, hopefully it's... Uh... Uh, have you had backlash about the book? Anybody sort of given you a bad time over it? Yes, uh, you know, not a lot. Uh, there were actually uh, two different occasions in which I was giving a talk, one of them, surprisingly enough, right here in New York City, where there were death threats, and Ooh. I was concerned because it meant that people had felt they had to put guards up, and, you know, that doesn't... That, that's just a mood that I don't like. Yeah. I've had some completely ridiculous. Um, I have in my collection, I think, I can't remember if it's a postcard or a letter that says, How dare you say the Klan was racist? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yeah. It's outrageous. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, you wonder what planet people are on. <laughs> uh, but um, actually, the most interesting thing is that there are people who have uh, documents from their grandparents or further back than that um, that show you how absolutely normalized the Klan was. I, I used to teach at the University of Wisconsin, and I'm in the middle of a project that's been developed there because the University of Wisconsin was one of many universities that had a Ku Klux Klan chapter as a registered fraternity. Uh, and there, w- w- we are discovering more and more of that. It was true at Harvard as well. Um, so I think that one of the things that I find interesting is just that people send me little tidbits uh, of new material, so to speak. Hmm. Oh, that's nice. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, it's amazing that they some people would be upset that the KKK is considered racist <laughs> because I, I, I would think that they would <laughs> own, own that. You know, mm-hmm. if it's their belief, it's the primary focus of why they are together. Um, why, why not? Own, right. Why not own it? I just I don't understand that. Yeah, but there is a certain kind of illiteracy in this uh, country. I, I don't even know <laughs> what what the person who wrote that meant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But well, anyway. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure. Um, you know, thank you for coming on the show. Um, the book we're talking about is The Second Coming of the KKK. And uh, we had the guest as the author, Linda Gordon. Thank you. Thank you for your interest in this. Take care. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.